the term pregnant with possibilities, but hopefully my presentation can be pregnant with possibilities for you guys this morning. Um, so I like to go to a lot of these events, much like you guys. I go to conferences. I go to creative mornings myself. I've been to other creative mornings in other cities. And I read a lot. And I read from different essayists, different bloggers. I read a lot of books. And so one thing that you kind of expect when you see these people up on stage, when you read these articles from bloggers, you expect a little bit of expertise. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Um, well, I, I can tell you this much. I'm not a CEO. I've never launched a company. Um, I've never written a book. And I don't even own a car. So me being qualified as a speaker sounds a little weird to me. So I'm going to let you in on a little secret in that I'm actually not an expert. I'm a bit of a working designer, much like everyone here in the audience. Um, but what's interesting is I've totally felt like I've enjoyed a really good career, a really fun career, whether it's at Threadless or 37 Signals. I've enjoyed what I've done. And I think a lot of what I've done happens to stem from me thinking about not the way everyone else pitches, how we should work, how we should be inspired, but maybe fucking things up a little bit and having things a little bit backwards, which is the theme for today. So um, I want to share with you guys just a little bit of what I've been thinking about recently. And much of it is really just terrible advice or in our our context, just backwards advice. So I want to do a quick show of hands. Who has business cards? Good. We're probably off to the wrong foot. Because my first thought that I've been thinking about lately is to burn your business cards. <laughs> um, really, because there's this odd notion in America. when whenever, whenever we introduce each other to ourselves or introduce ourselves to somebody else, we usually lead with our title, right? Our title, on whether it's on our business card or what we claim ourselves to be. So, hi, I'm Mig. I'm a designer. Or, hey, I'm Kyle, associate art director at Here and Here. Or, I'm Sandy. I'm a senior brand you know, evangelist. After a certain while of hearing all these people, I can't tell if the industry is playing a sick joke on me, because um, I don't know what the fuck a senior brand evangelist even is anymore. <laughs> And so that's really interesting to me that we kind of define ourselves by what's on this business card, what's on this title, when really we're robbing ourselves of a lot of really great possibilities if we forget about our title. So I, instead of just talking and ranting about it, I want to introduce you guys to some of the people I'm really lucky to work with. So this is the support team at 37 Signals. And if they were to have a business card, it would say support staff on 37 Signals. But they do way, way more than just answer emails helping people with their base camp problems. So for instance, Emily, she's a bit of a country gal. She plays instruments. Uh, she's a Texas girl. She's also a really good writer. And so of course, she's helping our customers with their base camp issues, writing them, helping them through their support ticket. But she does more than just helping people by answering emails. She actually writes on Signal versus Noise, where she tells us and shares with the entire community how to do customer support even better. She is a really great writer, to the point where she even helps me do my own work by helping me write a lot of different notification emails through Basecamp and what have you. So Emily is asked to do a lot of really great writing work. And then there's Anne. In a former life, Anne was a librarian. Now you're thinking to yourself, why would you hire a librarian? So Anne is doing support. Her librarian skills probably don't really come into play. False. So we have Basecamp, and we need to give great support for Basecamp. What better way and who better person to organize all the documentation and all of these write-ups about our products than a librarian? So Anne helped lead the charge redesigning the entire Basecamp help site. And she doesn't just organize these articles. She's actually touched every single piece in our Basecamp help site. And it's, and it's really awesome because with all of our support staff, they don't just write about how to use Basecamp. We actually teach them the tools of the company. So for Anne and all the support staff, we've taught them how to write Markdown. But we go a step further and teach them how to git push, git pull, and deploy. So they're actually using the tools at 37signals to write and update our documents. Um, 
And so when you, when you invite someone to do jobs they normally wouldn't do or at least aren't listed in their business cards, it sounds sort of terrifying and terrible in a sense. Um, <laughs> Every designer at 37 Signals is also a programmer, and not just a little sprinkling of CSS here and there, but we're actually getting our hands dirty with Ruby and even Rails. And so you, at first when you hear that, it's like, oh man, that is a terrible idea. But if we only stuck to the titles on our business cards, we wouldn't be able to do things like write our own scripts to scrape our Campfire API. And then my job would just be to make pretty pictures. But instead, I'm writing code to scrape all the really interesting links that we talk about uh, in our company campfire, which then turns me into a writer and a content maker and, a, and an editor. And so I get to do things beyond design, like making a newsletter for our entire community. Um, and then on that point, I think uh, our friend James Victoria had a really, really simple, poignant way of talking about this. Who cares? You know, why do we need a label? Or why do we choose to pigeonhole ourselves? I'm a graphic designer, oh, I'm an artist. Who the fuck cares? That's all I really want to show, who the fuck cares, <laughs> right? But actually, I did want to share one more bit of James Victoria's advice. Um, just don't ever work in advertising. Who the fuck cares? Selling, I sell Doritos. Fuck off. So maybe our business card allows us more than to just design Doritos and packaging. So if you have a business card, maybe it's backwards advice, but please consider uh, ruining your business card because consider this, companies aren't actually trying to hire uh, martial artists, mythical creatures, and or musicians. So if you're a rock star, ninja, or unicorn, um, consider another career. And so that. It's sort of broken advice, and maybe that's my next place I kind of want to go, is to break things. All our life we're told to make things, right? Every conference I've been to in the last three years, the sexy piece of advice, and I've told it myself, is to make things. Ooh, ooh, make things. What if we broke things instead? How about we spin off into that? Society tells us we shouldn't break things. It's dangerous to do that, and if you break things, you get in trouble. But I wouldn't have been able to do really fun projects like Humble Pie if I didn't learn how to break things. So if you're not familiar, I interviewed 40 or so uh, well-known creative people, designers, illustrators, and the like. Everyone from my own boss, Jason Fried, to Swiss Miss, who started Creative Mornings, all the way down to uh, local legends like um, Nick Campbell, who is one of our Creative Mornings speakers, Carlos Segura, Catherine Walker, all of our own city folk right here. And that project didn't start looking like this from the get-go. In fact, I didn't know a line of code at all. My entire project looked like a shitty WordPress template because that's how I started. But I invited myself to break things and shake things up. I'm really, really nervous trying to write a piece of program from scratch, from line one. But I don't mind going into something somebody already made, taking a line, deleting it, and going, oh, what the hell happens when I do that? Oh, shit, I break things. Um, but this is the process in which we can learn so much more if you decide to learn from somebody else who's done something great and break it and take it apart. So then when you go from breaking things and taking it apart, you go from that all sorts of magical keynote effects to this. And I actually wanted to show you one of the pieces of advice from this Humble Pie project from another local legend, Jim Cudall. The question is this, if you had just one bit of advice that you would share with a young creative type or anyone in general looking to break into getting into a creative career, what would that one bit of advice be? Um, this is maybe a little unconventional, but whether you're building web pages or designing logos or editing film or creating music or doing print layouts, I would suggest that a really beneficial thing for you to do is to rip something off that you love. And by that I mean find something that speaks to you, a design, a logo, a film sequence, something that you really admire for the way that it's put together and build it yourself. Start with a poster that you love, maybe from the Bauhaus, from Switzerland, and uh, put it side by side on your desktop with a blank Illustrator document and build that poster. Mm -hmm. Spec the type perfectly. Set up the grid the same way. Find out why things go where things go. Find out why particular scenes in a film sequence are edited together in the fashion they are, in the time that they are, and the way that the cuts work. Um, what you're really doing in this situation is you're working on your craft. You're looking at something that you really admire and you're trying to really get into the seat 
of the person who built this thing to begin with, to get into their head to see why they made the practical decisions that they made in creating this, whether it's a logo or a web page or anything else. Um, I'm not suggesting you take your ripped off item and represent it as your own. Right. I think you're doing this for the drawer, so to speak. You're doing this for yourself, but uh, I think it, it can be very beneficial and uh, not only that, it's a lot of fun too. Awesome. So there's my advice. Great advice. So rip people off for the sake of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, That should start a comment thread, I guess. So. <laughs> awesome, Jim. Well, hey, thank you so much for the advice. Sure. Look forward to seeing this and all the rest of these. So again, some pretty backwards advice from Jim Kudal, rip things off. But I wouldn't have gotten to this project or any of these other interviews if I didn't invite myself to break things. And there's a lot of breaking that happens when we work on the new base camp. For instance, this is a really early, early iteration of the people page in our latest uh, version of base camp. Pretty standard, you know, you've got your squares of photos of the people. Uh, I think one of our designers, Jonas, wanted to see how else can we make this a little more interesting. And what he intended to do was something a little more like this. Let's round the corners. But what ended, what ended up happening was a little bit of this. It was totally broken at first. We're like, oh, man, no, 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 fix that. that you, you broke it. But we realized, actually, that's pretty, pretty damn cool. And so because of us breaking things on accident, it ends up shipping in the final version of the product. When I actually got hired at 37 Signals, I wrote this big company-wide message. And I joked around, and I said, hey, really excited to be here. I hope I don't break anything. Well, Jason Freed was none too pleased with that, because he also then reminded me, if you don't break a few things, you aren't trying hard enough. So maybe, instead of making things, today we can start breaking things. And then, you think about it, if you break things, oh man, that gets a little ugly. Well, maybe that's the point. So often, we're concerned with making beautiful things. There's this unhealthy obsession in design right now with making beautiful things. Uh, we have our dribble accounts, and we have this and that, and it's just the beauty and the beauty in our work. What about making some ugly things? Again, it's really backwards, crazy advice. Um, but allow me to uh, explain a little bit. Because when we learn the basics of typography, as Jan Chikold teaches us, we get into a groove, we get into a rhythm, but I'm wondering in our generation, where's, where are the next David Carsons? Where are the guys fucking things up and making things ugly and all of a sudden turning these ugly things into art? And trust me, I know, because early on when I was a designer, I wanted to make really fun, beautiful things, whether it's illustrations and animated GIFs of sorts or designing skateboards for charities. I want this to be beautiful, whether it's designing flyers for different uh, shows, different posters for different artists, musicians, blogs, even the AIGA, uh, or just some of my favorite bands. I want all this stuff to be beautiful. But maybe beautiful isn't always the point, because maybe we're limiting ourselves to such a limited view. So for, uh, in the interest of me being incredibly vulnerable with all 100 plus of you guys, I'm going to show you some really ugly work. And it's this ugly work that's helped me become the designer I am today. So I think when I started my college career, I was in an intro to design course. Um, I couldn't fabricate a story about this piece of shit if I even tried. <laughs> there's a clapboard. There's Superman standing on a building. And uh, the angles are all off. There's no perspective. But I made this. And I was damn proud of this when I made this. And it's ugly. And I didn't care because to me, this was good. And I didn't want it to be beautiful. I just want it to exist. Um, one of my best friends, Matt Bourne, and I were, you know, we're all about helping the community, helping the greater good. And so together we designed this poster uh, for the recycling club. Uh, we weren't too keen on writing. If you can see our placement copy, it says blah, 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 more and more. We are awesome. No one beats us. So we're very confident young designers. But I think the more interesting thing is we use the colors poo, pee, and boogers all on the same poster. So I don't know if we should be putting that kind of skill set on our LinkedIn now or what. But we made that. And uh, it's really ugly. But it's helped us get to where we are now. The last thing I wanted to show you guys was this. Uh, it was a Photoshop class. And I went into this class knowing I knew Photoshop better than anybody else, right? I had layer text styles that nobody knew how to use. I had layer blend modes that nobody's even ever heard of. But then I realize at this class that Photoshopping isn't the same thing as designing, because I made this, and it's overtly sexual, and I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> but it's something that I made, and it's something that has my name on it. And because of me making fun things like this, it's allowed me to loosen up and making, hopefully, more beautiful work in the future. And I thought to myself, hey, maybe I'm not the only one making really ugly work. So I decided to ask some of my friends, uh, is anyone familiar with Mikey Burton? He's a really fantastic illustrator. Um, he makes really great work like this. And I asked them, hey, Mikey, 
show me some of your uglies. And uh, that was also a little sexual, sorry. Uh, so he shows me some of his bad work like this, and I'm like, wow, David Carson would love that. Um, so that's some of his early ugly work. Uh, Frank Camaro, another well-known designer in our, in our day and time, he makes really beautiful illustrative work like this. And I said, hey, Frank, send me something really nasty. Send me something that you've never shown the rest of the world. So he sent me this, and he said, oh, yeah, I put it together in a class in about five minutes. So again, this is really vulnerable stuff to be sharing some of our ugliest work. And then uh, Jessica Hish, she makes the most gorgeous lettering and illustration in, to, that we know of. Uh, so I asked her, Jessica, what else you got? Show us some of your ugly. And so she sent me this, where it's some terrible collage, scrapbook, neon Christmas color book. Uh, I don't know what it is, but you can't say that this same person made this. And that's the fun part, is that she didn't care. She thought this was beautiful. Um, and again, maybe if we think about making more ugly things and not giving a shit about really pretty things, we can get somewhere. Because imagine Craigslist if it was all sorts of shiny with the beautiful gradients, that one pixel shine. I know what the hell you're doing. What if Craigslist was like that? It wouldn't feel like we're getting a, a deal. So if you're buying six-month-old boxers on a really shiny website, maybe it wouldn't work. But because Craigslist is ugly, it feels like we're getting a cheap deal. And so lastly, I wanted to talk about um, spending less time on things. How many people work with clients and wish they had more time to work on any given project or wish they could extend a deadline? If you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> because I, too, wish I had more time to work on things. And then I realized, wait, what if I flipped that and gave myself less time to work on things? What happens then? What happens there? So I uh, did this project from under consideration where they uh, did a Word It project. What they do is they assign the entire community at large, like you guys, uh, one word to interpret in a month, and you get a square canvas size, and you interpret the word. So I tried it. I was at an ad agency job, and the first word was cut, so I made this. But I gave myself a limit. I didn't give myself one month. I gave myself 15 minutes just to make something totally random. It didn't have to be beautiful because I didn't really care. It didn't have to win me any awards because that's dumb. I wanted to just make things and practice my craft. So 15 minutes is all I gave myself. Um, clearly, I didn't like my advertising job, so this is what I made. The next month after that, the word was gone. And I think I had broken up with a girlfriend at that time. So I gave myself 15 minutes to do this. 15 minutes the next month was late. So maybe I moved on from that relationship. And then at this point, I'm realizing, hey, maybe I'm using too much of these found images and graphics too much. So let me challenge myself next month. So the next month was flow. And so I made this. And I only gave myself 15 minutes to sketch and comp that out. And then the next month after that was destination. So I decided to illustrate that again. And then I think one of the last ones I ended up on was here, where I said, maybe I'm just relying on Adobe tools too much. So maybe I can give myself 15 minutes and make something else. So I decided to use Google Maps to do uh, script typography uh, using their map tool. And so all of this really fast-paced, ugly, fun, really just crazy fast work helped to shape me into a really quick-paced designer at Threadless because I was called on a lot to do this kind of work where we would partner with comic book companies, coffee companies, and do these Threadless Loves partnerships where I would have to do really fast-paced work. And all of that work helped sharpen me for what Kim had mentioned earlier, layer tennis. So if you're unfamiliar with layer tennis, it's where two designers go back and forth 15 minutes at a time to take a design, hit it to the other designer, work on that design 15 minutes, hit it back and forth and back and forth. So I'll, I'll show you what it's like. So Jessica Hish was my first partner. I was about to throw in the towel right when I heard who I was fighting. Um, but so she starts off with this. She does the whole funny retro laser background photo. Um, and she just works her amazing type skills, which I definitely don't have. And so she tries to kill me right off the bat with this whole internet is awesome theme. So I have 15 minutes to retort. I have 15 minutes to take this design, turn it into mine, and send it back to her. So 15 minutes later, I send her this. And I make fun of her by saying, you don't get to 9,600 Twitter followers without tweeting stuff about your cats. Um, I knew that night I was going to watch the social network, so I kind of played off from that. But the more funny thing I thought at the bottom was a short bit.ly URL that actually goes to one of her tweets about her cats. So again, this is less about making beautiful things, because you only have 15 minutes. So 15 minutes later, she then says, new this winter from Threadless, ironic tea about both cats and the internet. <laughs> and she takes that quote I made and does this gorgeous typesetting on a t-shirt. Of course, it's Jessica Hish. So again, I only have 15 minutes to think of an idea, pull out my assets, 
design it, upload it, send it. Meanwhile, a writer is also spending 15 minutes writing about each one. Hope you can tell the intense amount of pace back and forth. We don't have a lot of time to think. So this is what I did. I put her shirt on one of our models and said, holy smokes, $5 tea sale, failed concepts, now up for grabs. <laughs> 15 minutes later, I think I had her right at this point. Maybe she was in a bit of a bind. So she busts out another internet meme, I can has meaning. So she throws a double rainbow at me. 15 minutes later, I respond with, hey, maybe the internet needs no rhyme or reason, like puppies. So if you're going to play the cat game, girl, I'm going to play the puppy game. So I do that, and I use some of one of her typefaces against her as fighting fire with fire. 15 minutes later, she does this, where she takes an Instagram of her cat, say, she says cats control the internet, then makes a Tumblr that says cats control the internet.tumblr.com. <laughs> when you go to it, there's an animated GIF of a cat laughing at me. <laughs> so I have 15 minutes to try to fight back. And so 15 minutes later, I send her this, where I actually tell her cats are lazy. Correction, I'm in control. And then I do the Konami code, which if you're unfamiliar with video games, it's god mode, meaning she can never win at this point. Um, and so 15 minutes later, she's on to my, she's on to my trick. So 15 minutes later, she says, cheating is lazy. Fatality. And uh, so she tries to kill me with uh, this whole video game concept. And so at this point, I have the last serve. If you are the last person to serve, you have a chance to either win the game or lose the game. And so I told her this. You know what? The internet and games aren't even the same as real life. Hit Command Q. I kill her cat. Say woof, and then I use a Photoshop palette to remind her we can still be friends. So I have a little bit of type in that Photoshop levels palette to remind her that her feelings shouldn't be hurt too much. Uh, so what ends up happening is I moved on into like playoffs. Um, and so a lot of this work ends up being sort of ugly, but then you'd be surprised because when Mark Weaver and I played, um, after a couple hours of work, we made this entire collage together, and I thought it was actually really nice, uh, all for just short spurts of 15-minute thoughts and pieces of work. And this whole concept of spending less time on things actually plays into what we do at 37 Signals. This is Basecamp. Well, at least it was Basecamp. We call it Basecamp Classic now. It's been our flagship product for the last decade. Last year, we relaunched it, and we only spent a year working on that. And so now, this is the new base camp, and it's our best work. We've got our best talent and our uh, best work in the latest base camp. We only spent about a year on that, but 10 years making the previous base camp. Um, so in the spirit of spending less time on things, I just want to thank you. Okay, so the question was, when was the last time one of my mistakes turned into a success? Um, damn, I should have answered my own question before I asked it to everybody else. Um, I think a lot of the work I do every day just feels like a mistake. I, I, you know, it's easy to assume that anybody that comes up to a lectern to talk about their work is pretty confident and an expert in what they do. But honestly, every day I, I make a lot of really shitty work and bad sketches, and all of those are my mistakes. And, uh, one thing I tell all the students that I teach is that ugly is part of the process. So I'm kind of just waiting my way through mistakes until I find the right thing that works. And that could be a small project, and that could be on a broader scale of my entire career. Maybe I worked in an advertising agency a little too long before I got to work on product. But I don't know. And all I know is that if it wasn't for me working some shitty jobs or working on shitty projects, I wouldn't have appreciated the kind of work I get to do now. Um, another question. I you do a lot with designing, writing, talking, you interview people. Like you're, you have a lot. Um, you do a lot to inspire everybody in the community. So, who or what is something that inspires you? So the question was: I do a lot in the community, whether it's writing and designing. Who in the community, or who in general, inspires me? Well. When I was a younger designer, I, I would read the books and you know the, the standard people like Sagmeister, Beirut, Cher, you know Santa Maria, Cedarholm, all these people. They're for sure icons, and they've helped you know pave the way of the work I wanted to do. But more and more now, it's just people that just do things that have nothing to do with design, people that are just really smart businessmen, people that are just doing really good things for communities in general that have nothing to do with design. I don't know, maybe there's a certain you know, maturity point in your career where you figure out 
maybe setting fonts and drop shadows isn't the only purpose of my life, but maybe changing people's lives in general. And so that's, if I had a longer t uh, talk, I'd probably suggest, you know, for as much as we make things for ourselves and improve our own portfolios and try to boost our way through our careers, uh, I think the bigger thing that I've realized from a lot of my own icons and my own heroes is that they are really just selfless. So, and maybe you guys can ask yourself the question, when's the last time you mentored somebody that was less experienced than you? When's the last time you taught somebody else something that you know that you think you didn't really know you were good at, but tried it anyway? And when's the last time you helped try to bring together your community, much like this, and um, do things for your community? Because I think doing all sorts of things that have nothing to do with you, or maybe even design, kind of boosts or at least crafts your career in ways you didn't expect. Um, does anybody have questions for Nick? Don't be shy. Dun -dun -dun. Yep. How did you pitch that, um, I forget what you call the humble pie, how did you, how did you pitch that to all those people or did you, how did you understand that before you even got started? When you did uh, so the question was, how did I get humble pie started? And really it started because, again, I didn't feel like an expert at anything. So my college that I graduated from had asked me, wow, Meg, you have a job, that's pretty weird. Why don't you come back to school and tell us how you did that? Uh, and so I was asked to speak at the student conference to just you know, be a shining gem of how you can get a job in this design thing. Um, but I really felt like a hack and a, a, a sham, and I didn't feel qualified to do that because these kids are my age too, and I didn't really do anything different. So what I did instead was I thought, what if I had all the people that inspired me and gave me advice, what if I just captured all that and just regurgitated it back to all these people, maybe they'll just get inspired and do the same things I do. So instead of working on this keynote presentation for um, this, pre this conference I was supposed to speak at, I started shooting emails to all my mentors, all of my old bosses, all my friends saying, hey, um, I really love when you helped me out in this point in my career. I'd love it if I could just do an iChat with you and record um, our iChat together. So a lot of these people, again, just close friends, all said, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So I just sent emails to a bunch of people saying, hey, you've impacted my career. Let me record these and share it with the world. And over time, I decided, you know, that person from across the US also inspires me and they've shaped my career. What if I sent an email to them and asked them to be a part of this project? And they all said, yeah, sure, that sounds like a totally good, helpful thing and it sounds like you're not in it for yourself, so let me just help you out. And so everyone I've ever asked has said yes, to the point where I actually got my inbox flooded with people wanting to contribute to this Humble Pie project and it's a one-man show so I didn't have enough time to edit all sorts of really great talks. Um, and there's like some regrets in there because I've asked people like Eric Speakerman and he said yes, but then I slept through our entire interview because he's on like Germany hours and I totally forgot about that. So sending emails, even if they're your heroes, totally pulled, pulled through for me because they all just said yes. Any other questions? Come on, it's Friday and I know you guys don't want to go back to work. <laughs> The question is, what's next? And I think that's the hardest question for any one single person to answer. Um, because two years ago today, you couldn't even pay me to believe that I'd be not working at Threadless and then now working at 37 Signals and speaking at the event that you helped start. So I, I tend not to plan too far in advance because I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, four years ago, I didn't even know I'd be working at Threadless, and yet I had a three-year stint through all of that. So I don't really like to, to plan too far in advance. And one of my favorite piece of, pieces of advice from Humble Pied was from Carlos Segura, and he said, you can't prepare for the future, you have to just be ready now. So I think we do this thing where we work on our portfolios, we work on our personal brands and our sites so that one day in the future we'll get that future job when nobody's really thinking, what if I just met that new boss in the elevator today, right now, what happens then? Are you not gonna have your site to show them? So I don't, I don't know, I try not to plan too far in advance because then I'm never in the moment of today and I think one, one of the things I've realized, especially in the last couple of years, it's way better to be in the moment now and kick ass now because kicking ass now is what leads to tomorrow. So try not to plan too far in advance. If you had one piece of advice for somebody who's new to this, what would it be? And it was a fair point because, sure, if you're, if you're already in the industry, it's easy to burn your business card, but if you're not in the industry, you need to start somewhere. So, um, well, the one thing I would definitely say is if you want to be in the design industry, make design. 
If you want to be a writer, write more. If you want to be a photographer, start taking some fucking pictures. Because you can't just wish to be something. You have to do the work and make the work. And I think one thing that I've noticed when I've taught uh, beginners at Starter League is that everyone struggles with their work because they have nothing to really show for because they realize how hard it is to actually do the work. And that is so underrated, just doing the work. So if you want to get into any industry, start, start doing it somewhere, whether it's really small projects, whether it's a little flyer for your friend's blog, might start that way, whether it's your Instagram account and you blow up, what's up, Paul? Um, you do it that way. So I, I just think you have to uh, start, start making things. You can't just apply the title and go, I'm a designer now. It's the design is what you have to show for in the work it, there in itself. Oh, great question. So the question was, I've talked a lot about expanding your portfolio, making lots of things, doing lots of new work. Uh, what about contracting and reducing work? And I, this is actually one of my favorite things to do. I think, I think there's this uh, idea that if you're a designer, you do just make a lot of stuff, you build a lot of stuff, you make a lot of stuff. But I think being a really good designer means being a really good editor. And so whether it's editing your tweet that you write in 140 characters, whether it's editing a blog post you write, or whether it's editing down the amount of colors you use in a design. I think editing is such a hard skill to learn, and editing is what, it, is what we do when we craft our portfolio. So all the work I showed now, I was never able to show even three years ago. And my student portfolio is pretty much locked up in the closet, and I never want to show it again. I think the more you make, the more you have to edit, too. So I think you, do, you, you sort of do both at the same time. Make a new thing, and then promise yourself you'll take out an old thing. And I think that's why when we see all these really great speakers who have had 25, 50-year careers, they're only showing their best work out of these, this entire 50 years. So um, if you wanted to, I think if you want to go for a really great career, maybe you learn how to be a really great editor, too. I don't know. How, do I be, how did I become so clear at explaining things? Uh, well, I realized that's what I'm supposed to do when I don the title designer. Um, that's a designer's job, is to explain things clearly. And that's why I riffed on stop making so many beautiful things, because it isn't about making beautiful things. It's about communicating things well. So if it's through an uglier design or a more beautiful polished design, the point is of communication and explaining things clearly. So I think that just comes along with a decade of trying to do this over and over all the time, screwing up and trying over again. Um, and speaking in front of people is something I never thought I'd do either. And the first time I ever gave a talk, I probably bombed it. In fact, I know I did. So uh, it just comes similar to Jason's question, how do you do this? It's do it often and edit. Um, if you don't keep trying, you'll never know what you're capable of, I guess. Thanks, guys.